Hey gang, what's good? Welcome back to Pillars of Eternity, the White March. Sorry, I'm adjusting my mic a little bit here. It's, uh, it's drifting away, as I've said before. Sometimes it, it just drifts. It's a low-tier, professional-quality mic. <laughs> just say the word. I ain't made of money, baby. But hey, we make do with what we got. Speaking of which, we got no campfires, and we're heading Ready into the are. deep darkness of Galvino's workshop. Might run into something real awful down here. At least that's what it seems like is about to happen. Like Mecha Galvino in some sort of giant mech suit or something. Oh, a cell key. A plain iron key found discarded in Galvino's workshop. Maybe it was for that uh, one person who we busted out. An exceptional club. One-handed. We don't have a club user. We don't have anyone who we can meet in the club for when it's going down. <laughs> meet me in the club. It's going down. Meet me in the... God, I don't even remember the rest of the words. Meet me in the hood. It's going down. Gosh. It's been so long since I've heard that. Alright, let's pop this open. Ah, there we go. It swings open. You see how it how it's rendered differently? It's actually rendered in the world to show it open that way. It's very obvious how it looks. Um, that's because a lot of the background is actually just 2D. Just say the word. It's pretty amazing how they pulled that off. Alright. Oh, this must be it. Okay, let's quick save. Big boss fight in here, huh? Dun 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 dun. Oh shit, it really is. Galvino. <laughs> Look at him. He's like Geppetto. With his stupid mustache. I guess that's that that is the inspiration. Uh an elderly man hunches over a cluttered desk in the back of the workshop. His flesh is pulled tightly around thin, fragile looking bones, except around his neck, where it hangs in loose wattles. He turns as you enter. A scowl already chiseled into his lined face. Back again? I told you. He hesitates, squinting at you from behind smudged and dusty spectacles. Well, that's not true at all. He's got a monocle. He doesn't have spectacles. Of course, a fresh fool to replace the last fools. What brings you stomping through my workshop, eh? He draws his words out, looking you up and down. A sneer creeps across his face. I've got questions about Durgan's battery in the White Forge. What's your tone, old man? Seems like you already know. I sell false teeth. Heard you could use a new set. <laughs> what a fucking shit-eating response. What were those things? Uh... I guess, yeah, let's be honest, I got questions. Straight to business, no nonsense. We appreciate that, don't we? I, I guess. He turns to the bronze golem over over his shoulder. Uh-oh. Anything for a breather from your endless yammering. Oh, it's Nebula from the Guardians of the Galaxy. What? Nebula? What? What? what, 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 what? The voice echoes from within the golem. <laughs> hey, I've got a fancy for this in already. Hear that, fuck I'm me, Fuck me, why'd I do that? We tolerate barbs <laughs> and insults. <laughs> I'm Mora. Um. Okay. Uh, get on with it. I didn't come to listen to you to bicker. Anyhow. <laughs> Wait. Say nothing. Um. Yeah, let's see where this goes. But you come seeking the White Forge. Like they all do. Boys with smooth cheeks and wild dreams. Girls with bright ribbons tied next to their scabbards. Oh, I do have smooth cheeks and wild dreams. <laughs> His voice rises and falls with a sing-song of mockery. Old men and women, too, seeking a final blaze of glory before they're snuffed out for another turn at the wheel. Sound familiar? His smile is rigid as he looks at you, and the corner of his eye twitches. You've said all this before, I take it? I'd rather strive for greatness than wither in the shadows. What a pompous jackass of a response. That's a lot of bitterness. Maybe I should ask you the same thing. It's just another job. Uh, yeah, let's, yeah. This is the Mike Ermintrout. It's just another job, Walt. Don't take it too seriously, kid. Jesse, 
You're gonna do all right. Just do what I tell you and stay close. It's gonna be fine. Verus, just another job to find the treasure of a civilization beneath an impenetrable keep. <laughs> Gilarde, what a thrill your life must be. Gilarde. Um. I have this conversation with every pig-headed swashbuckler those Postanagos and Stalwarts send here. Postanagos? Oh, shit, that's a new one. <laughs> Postanagos! Go see Garvino, they say. Surely he'll help you. Oh, shit, that's what... That's what Palagina says. When she uses her, um, her wrath attack, where she shoots her great balls of fire, she says, Postanagos something something! And she fires away. Oh, we're, we're learning what Palagina... We're learning about what she says. Anyways... Hmm, must have slipped their minds what a busy and important fellow you are. In the silence that follows, the temperature in the room seems to drop. Galvino glares at her. They should have let them stone you. Would have silenced your endless rattling forever. The hanging folds of skin beneath his neck tremble. <laughs> then you'd have naught but those frostbitten inbreds for company. Jeez. I guess this is what it'd be like if Aloth and Islemir were two separate people. <laughs> Come now, I don't sound... I sound nothing like either of them. Uh, you're upset. There's an old wound with Stalwart then? Uh, yeah, let's say that. Let's use our perception. <laughs> the spiteful imbeciles destroyed my career. Ruined years of work. <clears throat> but, let us focus on the reason for your visit, yes? This guy is fucking Matthew Mercer, isn't it? Is that why they chose not to have Aloth and uh, Edder speak here? Because it would be weird to have three Matthew Mercers speaking to each other? <laughs> when he did the whole throat clearing thing, I was like, hmm, that sounds like Edder and McCree and every other character <laughs> got, that he does. Hey, I'm glad the guy is getting work. I like him. He seems like a stand-up guy. Anyways. Um... The Continue. villagers and their adventurers hammer and pry at the battery as if they were laying siege to some moldering lord's keep. Hmm. He swats the air in front of his face. But those stones were laid by some of the finest builders ever to have lived. Disciples of Abidon in the truest sense. Hmm. They will not fall by the whims of any kith. And the door itself, it is infused with living essence. He holds his hands before him. And his eyes are wide with wonder. So that's why the dwarves disappeared. They got locked out of their own fortress. No, they probably are in in the fortress's walls. They are part of the fortress now. So how does one get into the fortress? With the secrets of the Pargrun and dwarves, of course. He taps his balding head. The Pargrun and of Durgan's battery perished within their own keep. Victims of a violent disagreement among their own commandants. Right. His mouth twists into a wicked grin. Why is he so bemused by this? Surely in the village you have heard stories, no? Disappearing caravans, tracks in the snow, screams from the high towers. He pauses, watching your expression with a raconteur's glee. The work of spirits still trapped in the battery, and a testament to those impenetrable walls. He raps on the more tired, mortared stone of his own home. But the door of the keep, the one the Pargrunen filled with essence, oh, it was made to listen, to recognize its masters. Oh, I should have rolled a dwarf. Would have been so much easier. Uh, so I need the door to recognize me. Traditional Optopo cultures revolved around language. Words revealed who they were and where they Wait. were from. Am I going to have to open Sesame this shit? Is that what he's saying? That is why you need a Kantek. Oh. What's a Kantek? Some liken it to a poem. Others to an anthem. In reality, oh, no, wait, yeah. it is more than either. He holds one hand out, turning it this way and that in a balancing motion. A Kantek is a statement of purpose. A declaration of identity. Each is unique to its stronghold. Ha! Seal your door with a K 
key of words, and any liar can talk his way through. There's nothing built of words that won't break when the slightest stress is applied. <laughs> I've really enjoyed doing Durance's voice. Thus, to enter a fortress like Dorgan's Battery, you would stand at the gate and recite its cantic. I don't know if I'm good at doing his voice, but it's fun. He spreads his arms, his face aglow. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> Very well, where would I learn this cantic? What an incredible tradition! <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's very interesting. I don't need the history. I just want to know how to get into Durgan's Battery. Uh, let's yawn and say fascinating. <laughs> oh, no! Sorry! He dismisses you with a flick of his hand. To learn the Kantek, you must speak with one of the dwarves of Durgan's Battery. A shame they are all dead, no? Oh, but surely there is one I can speak to, huh? Because I have the superpower to speak to the dead. But no doubt their souls live on in one or two of the villagers of Stalwart. Like fine wine poured into a cheap pot. Derision curls his lips. But to identify them, that is the first problem. You would need the skill of an anamancer. Uh, I'm a watcher. The golem swivels her head sharply toward you. Her mask of a face and the glass eyes behind it betray no emotion, but it seems as if she's watching you carefully. Uh-oh, Nebula's gonna fight us. We're gonna have to fight her. Watcher? Diverus? Diverus. If this is true, then you could find a sole descendant from Durkin's battery, no here. question. But the greater difficulty remains. Galvino rubs his gaunt, whiskered cheeks. God, he's getting so turned on by me being a watcher. Golly! We're gonna have a good time in here. You would have to learn the Kantek from the dormant soul. And to do that, you would have to awaken it. Uh-oh. But this awakening would be permanent, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Whoever you awaken will live with the memories and the personality of a past life. Maybe peacefully, maybe not. Fuck, that seems bad. Mmm... Hopefully there's someone who will volunteer, because I really... That seems real bad to force someone to do that. That is why you must pay attention to the soul you would awaken, no? It is a uh, monumental thing to impose yes. on another, but... These are the very people who wish to rediscover the White Forge, Verus. Hmm. He removes his spectacles and polishes the dirty lenses with his tunic. So the Kantek is all I need? Who can say? None have yet opened Durgan's battery. Fair enough. Galvino raises his hands, palms up. He does a little Larry David. But the ones that came before you, I think they got close. They may keep. wish to find them and see what they discovered. Uh, I found what's left of them. A journal and a tile. Most interesting. He adjusts his spectacles as he peers at the tile. They spent many days at the battery door. This looks like something that once belonged there. He taps the tile. So awaken someone, how would I do that? An awakening is merely the jolting of a dormant soul into consciousness. He makes a bursting motion with his hands, splaying his fingers wide. When such things happen normally, it is because something has reminded the subject of a past life, often violently so. He smacks his workbench with surprising vigor. You like that? A little RP there for you, huh? Smack my own desk. Aloth flinches. Yeah, sorry. Thus, to awaken one of the former dwarves of Durgan's battery, you will need to address that soul, preferably by name. He folds his hands together, steepling his fingers. But show some care. When you examine these souls, whatever it is you watchers do, you may see images, memories... Uh-oh, we're gonna see something fucked up. He leans forward, his back hunched. These are moments of special import. What you see will tell you much about the person, and uh, perhaps the condition in which they awaken. He raises his hoary eyebrows and tilts his head back. Awaken them from a traumatic memory, and who knows? Maybe they awaken thirsty for blood. Or maybe you awaken someone else. <laughs> he cackles again. 
You understand the consequences of an awakening as well as any, Lyle. Yet perhaps there's a benefit to the process as well. Here. This has been tuned to the Eon of Durgan's battery. Use it near the villagers, and it should tell you if one has a soul old enough to have come from the battery. He rummages around and produces an unfamiliar device. Galvino's Resonance Amplifier, added to inventory. I see. Thank you for your help. Are we not going to have to fight him? You have much work ahead of you. As do I. He nods and turns back to his desk. I'm going with him. I'm sorry, Nebula? What, what, what? Dude, this is just like the sequel! The golem looks between you, her neck turning on its oil joint. You? Go to Star Wars? Is this your macabre sense of humor, or uh, has something gone to rust in that beautiful head I crafted? Galvino stares at her, agape. No one will bother me while I'm with him. Besides, I can help him find people in Star Wars. The golem's burnished face is eerily impassive. You, you haven't been to Stalwart in 13 years. And this watcher sees souls. What help could you be? Besides, I have need of you here. You owe whatever remains of your wicked life to me. What the hell is he talking about? What happened? A frown sours on his lips as he taps his chest with a crooked finger. The golem says nothing, but her essence smolders. Resentment rises from her in shimmering waves. She swivels her head to look at you. What's the story between you two? <laughs> this charming specimen is a convicted murderer. <clears throat> the devil of Carrick, she's called. Shit. Mighty fine of you to start with my good qualities, and you wonder why we don't get more visitors. She is like Nebula. What the heck? Killed over a dozen people before they finally caught up to her in Stalwart. Perfect company for lonely camps and mountain passes, no? He nudges you, all the while grinning wickedly at the motionless golem. Hey, I know how to start a campfire. The only reason she's not a frozen corpse is because I convinced the old mayor to let me try an experiment. A shadow passes over his face. You put a person's soul into a metal body? Why did you build her? Why is she called the Devil of Karak? Aren't you afraid she'll murder you? Uh... Why did you build her? Why build a fortress, or a village, or anything? To make something that keeps, that... Hmm. Yeah, fair enough. It was the early days of the legacy. My peers in the colleges of animancy were filling the hollowborn with the souls of animals. He pauses, scratching his chin. You're right. By comparison, this sounds perfectly sane. He rolls his eyes. I thought there was a better way. He is silent for several seconds, his gaze growing distant. One with a plum academy job back in Salona? Don't forget that part. He glares at her with narrowed eyes. Ah, now we know the truth. Reputation is everything in the republics, and that reputation is built on success. You put a person's soul into a metal body? He leans back, raising his hands. Into a work of art! Look at this! Craftsmanship worthy of a jeweler! He traces the scroll work that runs along the golem's jaw. Fully articulated joints, capable of grasping a pen and writing her own name. He grabs her hand and delicately bends her tapered fingers. This could have gotten really weird, you know? He could have made, like, a sex bot or something. Mm, Galvino, you're weird. Also, you tried to kill me. What the hell? And of crushing your throat. <clears throat> she snatches her hand away. Show me another smith anywhere in the Deerwood who is capable of such delicacy and precision. She is a masterpiece. Galvino steps back and takes a longer look at her. So why is she called the Devil of Karak? She committed her first crime in the village of Karak. Karak burned their family alive in their home. He shrugs. Did the same thing in half a dozen other villages, but the name stuck. What the hell? Why? Aren't you afraid she'll murder you? She may be mad, but she's no fool. 
she wouldn't survive long on her own. If the villagers didn't send a hunting party after her, the Eremans would claim her. Her joints and mechanisms require maintenance, and she cannot perform all of it herself. So what happens to her when you die? See, he's reminding me. In case I get any bright ideas. I take it your experiment didn't go over so well with the rest of the village? Ah, uh, here we go. She rolls her eyes, rasping them against their sockets. They were going to stone her anyway. Why not allow her to be put to some useful purpose? His lips curl back from yellowing teeth. My life's ambition. To serve somebody's useful purpose. Better than no purpose at all. I approached Mayor Sinahiod and begged. He saw the potential and allowed me the privilege of attempting my little experiment. He sneers at the words and the indignity they recall. His shoulders are stooped and his teeth are bared. Then I accomplished what few Hanamancers have even dreamed of. No academic support, no patron. Just me in the middle of nowhere. He jabs a finger into his concave chest. Oh, now you got him all wound up. I transferred a fully intact soul from a living subject to a fabricated body. She retained her personalities, her memories, all of it. He claws at the air with one thick-veined hand. Yet the villagers saw only a stolen corpse. He throws up his hands. So she's a companion. Man, I thought I was going to have to fight, fight him, or at least one of them. Okay. Uh, well, I have no idea what kind of class she would be. A robot? Robot class. She's a fine specimen. Her personality notwithstanding. He waves one hand in a circular motion. The golem says nothing, but her essence smolders. Resentment rises from her in shimmering waves. She swivels her head to look at you. I have no need of the golem's company right now. Farewell. I'd like her to travel with me. Sure, why not? Let's get as many people as possible. Quay? No, no, no. You don't know what you ask. He shakes his head, waving his hands. This woman, the devil of Karik, she was a notorious murderer. Burned people alive all over the region. Hmm. Besides... She works for me. After all, I am the one who preserved her. He strains his back and looks you up and down, taking your measure. Ah, uh, so we can get for free. Uh, let me parade her around town. It'll infuriate those villagers. You'd like that, wouldn't you? So you get use of the devil's services, and I get the satisfaction of knowing those stiffnecks are sweating through their small clothes, eh? Hmm. He sighs, but a smug grin has already worked its way across his face. It's a deal. Wow, okay. Fine price for a blacksmith striker. Suppose I should be flattered. Yeah, free. What? And there you have it. A huh. bargain. Fish guts and murder. <laughs> sure, I'm into that. Uh, what is she? Oh, she's a rogue. Okay, well, you're not coming with us. <laughs> I'm the rogue here, all right? There can only be one. Hmm. And if we were to replace anyone, who would we even replace? It would have to be Maneha or Durance. Because I'm not getting rid of Aloth, Eder, or Palagina. They have to be in the group, since I know that they're going to be in the sequel. And Durance seems essential as a priest. So it would just really be Maneha. Hmm. A shame we can't, like, talk to them at, um, Cad Newer, though. Because, um, a lot of these new companions, they seem pretty cool. Like, uh, her and Zawa. Kana and Sagana, you're okay, too. Oh, well. A moment. You are going back to Stalwart, yes? Perhaps you could do me a favor. Galvino gives you a thoughtful frown. Tell me about this favor. There is a man in the village named Grinde, the head fisherman. The rest of Stalwart kisses his feet because he fills their stinking blades with speckleback. Speckleback? I know he's not as virtuous as he seems. 
His face crinkles in vicious glee. Um, seems like you have a history with uh, Grinde. That self-righteous meddler engineered my eviction from the village. He turned them all against me. Huh. Now I want him to feel the scorn of those mush-brained imbeciles. What exactly do you want me to do with him? Humiliate him, of course. Show his neighbors what he truly is. And let him live with the disgrace. He points vaguely in the direction of the village, his thin arm trembling. What is he truly? He's always been a ripple sponge addict. Just got good at hiding it once his sainted sister died and left him in charge of the fishery. <laughs> this seems petty as hell. But he keeps a stash in the fishery, sneaks in at night when the others have gone home, and emerges sluggish and red-eyed a few hours later. I want you to expose him. Go to the fishery after dark when it's empty. Find his ripple sponge and show it to Renengild. Okay. I see. Uh, do not answer me now. But when you return to that festering eyesore and smell the stink of fish that hangs in the air, consider what I've said. Hmm. He grins. Besides, you appreciate a good joke, don't you? The Verus, this will be a great one. But be sure to approach the fishery by night, when it's empty. They will give you no end of trouble if they see you stealing during the day. Um... I want to know more about the expeditioners who came to you before. What were those constructs I encountered in your workshop? Yeah, tell me about those constructs. And why did you have them attack me? Other projects, they are none of your concern. You seem pretty eager to change the subject. Feels <laughs> dark. What? What? What's the word? Pagan, Paganados. He mutters furiously under his breath, raising his hands to the ceiling. For years, I've been trying to create another like the Devil of Carrick. Yet those Postenagos in Star Wars destroyed my machinery. His drooping skin trembles in his rage. Now, I can only create these broken, mindless things. The devil remains my most perfect creation. The devil. His lips twist with the taste of something bitter. Wait, where have you found the souls to create these other golems? Smugglers, slavers, fugitives. The kind of riffraff that passed this way. Rarely missed, and good work to keep my little devil busy. He shrugs. Why do you need more golems? I can't present the devil of Carrick to the academies, can I? A mad woman and a murderer? No. I need to bring a success to the republics. So, yeah. Other riffraff like smugglers and shit? Okay, sure. That makes sense. He rubs his hands together, frowning. Uh, I've heard enough. Galvino is already lost in thought, his eyes twitching at some mental calculation. Uh, I wanted to know more about the expeditioners who came to you before. As would I, but there is little to tell. They never gave their names. He tugs at his whiskers. But they seem to know more about the battery than the others, which is unusual because they did not seem like typical adventurers. He raises his snowy eyebrows. Their hands were smooth and marked with ink, not scars. And they traveled light. Unusually so. He rubs at his chin. Unusual indeed. What do you suppose they were looking for? Val himself could not have said, and I haven't the time to concern myself with the business of strangers. Something else? Quay. Uh, tell me again about how to awaken someone? I mean, that's... Let's see if it gives any new dialogue. You're the Watcher, so you know better than anyone, Diverus. You must find a sole descendant of one of the dwarves of Durgan's battery. Talk to the villagers, look into their souls, whatever it is you do. He waves a hand. When you find such a one, remind the sleeping soul of its old name. Awaken it thus, and it can teach you the Kantek. Okay, farewell. Hmm... Okay, well, I'm assuming it'll probably be, um, the mayor, right? Ready when you are. Is this stealing if we... no. 
Oh, shit. Okay, there we go. I was holding down tab. Um. Okay. Yeah, the fisherman of Stalwart. He warned me to search the buildings at night when all the fishermen have gone home. Stash of ripple sponge. I mean, I guess we'll investigate it. Why not? Just say the word. Feels kind of bad to show some guy's addiction and be like, Haha, look at this guy! He's addicted to something! He's an addict! Everybody make fun of him! <laughs> Seems pretty mean-spirited. Let's see, what have we got here? The white that wins. You're just gonna take all your books. Hope you don't mind. Take your potions. Hey, get out of there! Uh, yeah, take some of that too. We're just gonna rob you right before your very eyes. This appears to be a crude rendering of the mountain surrounding Durgan's battery. And a potion of major endurance. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, who should we give this to? What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? Eyes open. Let's see. Can we detect anything? Nah. Hey man, consider it the fee for having to kill all your people, you know? Like, what the heck? If they didn't work out, why'd you keep them up like that? Just attacking people willy-nilly who come in here. So I guess the reason why we can't uh, disarm this one is because our mechanics is just too low. And this is a really powerful sort of thing. Ready when you are. Let's quick save here as we go over. Hi. Don't want to accidentally trigger it. Just say the word. Okay. Is this the no? Good thing we didn't tell him about taking that gun that has like a person inside of it or something like that, or at least it used to. I think we killed the person out of it. <clears throat> Not sure how that works. Okay. Um, what do I want to do with this Fisher guy? Maybe we'll do it. Maybe... It is XP. That's, that's the most alluring thing about it, is that it is XP. And that's pretty good. Gosh, did you just see um, that flash just then? It flashed of um, like my audio recorder and my uh, my volume mixer, all that stuff. Weird. Hopefully, it didn't bug them out. Ready when you are. Okay. Um. Let's see. I guess we'll head all the way back out, right? Let's quick save and just go there. We also need to remember that we need to hit back up Cadnua for this quest that we have. We have seven, eight days. Gosh, I really didn't expect that to be a whole dungeon inside of his cabin. That was neat. It's amazing how much easier this area is compared to Long Watch. Okay, Stalwart Village. Hmm. What if it's her son that actually we need to awaken? That would be an interesting twist. Or maybe there'll be multiple people. I don't know. I mean, if her son... Well, no, because that's not how it works. It Just wouldn't necessarily be that if her son is available for it, that so is she. Okay. Maybe we can go talk to the fisherman and, and see what he has to say for himself. Let's go over here and see. Because it is daylight, so they'd all be around there working. We can't necessarily just wait for nighttime. I mean, I guess we could. We could just stand, stand around and let the game idle. 
All right, here he is. What do you have to say? Need something else. Uh... His eyes rove around the fishery, following the various activities and operations carefully. I've got questions about the fishery? Been running it four decades now. I reckon I can tell you what you want to know. I hear your sister was once in charge here. Arda was a saint. Lived to look after the village, she did. Fell through a weak spot in the lake ice. His gaze grows distant, and he scratches at his salt and pepper beard. You'll pardon me, but it's not something I much care to dwell on. Uh, that's all. Need anything else? Hmm. We're gonna screw him. So, we may as well read his soul. Let's invade him. As you reach for Grinda's essence, you find yourself wrapped in the cold embrace of a snowstorm. You trudge through the snow, each step laborious to your numb feet. You keep your head down against the wind, and your back is bent under a heavy burden. Ahead of you is the frozen lake and the hole you made in it. Oh, right, we're reading him to see if he's related to the dwarves, I see. Your feet crunch over the ice. You wait, and secretly hope for the telltale crack beneath you. With the village distant and dark behind you, you would sink and none would know. At least, that would free you of the heavy, churning feeling in your gut. Yet, you reach the hole, and the ice is still steady under you. You heft the burden off of- Oh my god, is it his sister? You heft the burden off of your shoulders, cradling it. Cradling her- Yep. Oh, shit. In your arms, she's wrapped in nets and weighted with stones. You wish one of the priests of Andra were here with, the, with solemn words and the assurance of ceremony. Instead, you slip a bracelet off of her wrist. Andra will have her body, and you will carry this reminder. You slide the bundle into the water and watch it sink, as it dwindles to nothing more than a dark stain beneath the ice. You feel a scratching in your throat, and hear the wind moaning into your ear. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It takes a moment to realize that you're hearing your own voice muttering. You surface from the vision. Whatever it is, it has nothing to do with Durgan's battery. Jesus. Farewell. Uh, let's bring up... Now let's bring up Galvino. <laughs> Need something else. I spoke with... I spoke to Galvino. He mentioned something about you. I bet he did. He despised our when he lived among us, and all the more when we gave him the boot. Never knew the old man to stay silent, that's for sure. He wrinkles his nose, scowling at some old memory. Um... Hmm. We can either not bring it up, or we can bring it up. I mean, it makes sense, I guess, that he would be an addict as a way to deal with the stress. I mean, not that everyone who has immense stress like that deals with it by becoming an addict to some sort of narcotic. But it seems like a plausible thing to have happened here. Anyways, he told me you're a ripple sponge addict. He wanted me to search the fishery for your stash. Seems the old man's venom has dulled his senses. Grinda's expression is suddenly rigid. Still, I'm glad you're too reasonable to pay heed to that nonsense. I'd hate to see the fishery torn apart by some gullible adventurer on one of his full errands. I'll see to it that there's nothing here for them to disturb. He tugs at his beard, glancing around the shelves. Right. Oh, I failed it. Okay. I got money, though. Yeah? That's fine. I'd feel kind of bad about exposing him like that. All right. So, hmm. Who might we check? Probably the mayor, right? Like, that's that's the biggest and foremost thing. Let's see. Um, yeah. Yeah? Someone who has the soul, or an, an ancestor soul? A soul sister? That's a... <laughs> that's a weird one. Can we just talk to anyone? No. Okay. 
Let's check in with her. I bet it's either her or her her son. Maybe her son, because her son seems so reluctant. Yeah. He'll probably get killed along the way, and she'll feel terrible about it. All right. So, my money is on it being her son. But let's check with her first. You've been busy since we last spoke. I want to thank you for what you've been doing for Stalwart. Right. I can't even I can't even ask her permission. I just do it. Let's examine her soul. Your awareness settles beneath Renengild's skin. You feel yourself looking through her eyes upon a time-faded memory. You're standing in the inn. The room is stifling, but it's the body heat of so many furious villagers, not the neglected fire pit that's drawn sweat from your pores. Your husband waits by the door, about as far as he can get from the assembly. He holds Uldric, whose cheeks are bright as he watches the adults bicker with wide, fearful eyes. You'd never realized how badly your neighbors stank, but something rank and repulsive rises from them as they be as they pack together in this room. How much did the old snake pay you, Sina Heod? It's Grinda, the head fisherman, jabbing a furious finger toward the back of the room. Sina Heod, your erstwhile mare, squirms in a corner, pinned by the accusing stares of the entire village. Oh, those eyes. They're cruel, porcine eyes. And they're watching Sina Heod with the dumb gluttony of hogs staring at fodder. The only sight that turns your stomach more is Sina Heod himself, trying to wriggle free of his own lies. <laughs> Maestro Calvino and I came to an agreement. It was for the good of Stalwart. I thought... You thought you'd let a killer walk among us? A woman in the middle of the crowd waves her fist. Cries of fierce agreement rise from the others. What began as a collective grumbling is swelling and congealing like storm clouds. You look back at your husband. He's whispering to Uldric. But when you catch his eye, he directs a silent supplication to you. Let's go. A wet smack draws your attention back to the other end of the room. Someone's thrown a potato, and Sinahiod cringes and rubs his jaw. You want to shout at them all for this nonsense and waste, but you know this is about to get worse. Stalwart will have blood, and Galvino and his horror had the sense to flee already. You turn again, and your husband is beckoning you with swift, chopping motions. But what stops your breath is Uldric. His little eyes are fixed on the churning mob, and you knew ever since you started hearing about those hideous purges that he'd see something like this one day. But did it have to be so soon? It's what drove that devil woman to madness, and now his little eyes have gotten big, big enough to swallow the whole scene, and now he's seeing you as part of it. You want to leave now. But if you do, this is what your boy will remember. Cowardice and madness. About people, about stalwart, about you. The people around you jostle and bark in their rage. They're dangerous animals, but animals nonetheless. They just need to be led. So you push your way to the end of the room, where Sinahid trembles in a puddle of his own piss. Enough. Your voice boils up from your throat. The others fall silent, watching you. They listen, dumbly trusting, as you turn Sinahid's death sentence into an exile. No one contradicts you when you explain that he's going to march out of this village alone and into whatever miserable hamlet will have him. They silently agree when you explain that their hands are too clean for the likes of him. But there's something else forming behind their eyes. A kernel of trust and dependence. You feel it curdling around you, encasing you like a pearl does sand. You only wanted to spare Sinahiod's life, 
not volunteer for his job, but you see so much fear simmering just beneath their expressions. Fear at godmen marching through the mountains, at deer woodens and their purges, at dying the slow and lonely death of a ghost town. And you see their grateful reassurance mirrored in Uldric's expression. Perhaps this place is hopeless, but you realize that you can't leave it any more than you could leave your boy. The only person who isn't looking at you is your husband. He's shaking his head, his eyes on the door. You retreat from Renengild's memory. Vivid, though it is, it has nothing to do with Durgan's battery. What's on your mind? Oh my god, Renengild, that was incredible! What a story! What amazing writing there was in that little tale! That was great! I loved that! Wow, that Say was so word. good! I sure All hope right. you were right about killing Baragon. Because when you leave us for milder lands, it's us or kin will come after. Hmm. He folds his eyes and looks at you with tired, doubting eyes. Uh... Before we read his soul, you seem to disagree with Renengild on quite a few matters. Mother's convinced that a magic forge will turn this frozen crack into a hub of civilization. She can't accept this place is dying. Me? I'd just as soon move on. He scrapes the sole of his boot on the straight but weathered floorboards. Something else you need? What do you do here? I'm a carpenter. Mother's a builder. So it felt like a good fit at the time. He presses his lips into a wry frown. Not that we've got a lot of new folk to build houses and furnishings for. These days, I spend most of my time fixing up the stockade. Yeah, well, there's also that burnt-down building. Someone should probably do something about that, you know. Seems like a hazard. <laughs> do you know anything about Durgan's battery? It's a fool's hope. A fantasy that's kept these parts inhabited longer than they should be. He glances around the old house and its worn furnishings. They say the Pargrunan dwarves developed Durgan's steel, became powerful rich. Powerful rich. And then one day, they locked their doors and died. He shrugs, turning his palms toward you. <laughs> Another Larry David, huh? Nothing like a mystery to stir folk up. Most of Stalwart is convinced that some Pargrin secret will save us all. But that don't stop them from whispering a prayer when they pass the old fortress. A sour smirk crosses his lips. Uh, alright, let's read his soul. Like I said, my money is on it being him. You reach for Uldric's essence and find yourself staring at a fence post lying in a filthy slush of frozen mud. Snow gathers around your legs and trickles into your boots. A wind nips at you even through layers of fur. You hold a wood chisel in one numb hand and a mallet in the other. Kneeling over the fence post, you get to work. Hour after hour, you hammer away. Feeling the tools grow heavy in your grip as your breath fogs your vision. You want to do better work than this. You can do better work than this. But no one's building new houses in Stalwart. The last table you crafted was put into the fishery, and pike entrails now trace the fine dovetail joints you so lovingly carved. Now you mend the stockade, because that's what's needed. The chisel slips, skidding alongside your hand. You gasp, but you hold up your hand and see, much to your relief, all five fingers wiggling back at you. You need to get out of this town. You pull back from Uldric's soul. He's still staring into the fire, seemingly lost in his own memories too. Huh, okay, well, I was wrong. Just say the word. <laughs> Hmm, who could it be? Maybe Thiersh? There's another house to the uh, northwest of Renningilds. Maybe it's that person. We could try and have a look in there. Sorry, I had to take a drink of water. Yeah? All this reading has gotten me thirsty. Yeah, Tana's house. Because we haven't really spoken to this person. Chekhov's gun, right? They gotta be here for a reason. 
Maybe it's this. We'll find out. Yeah, it really must be her. Because she hasn't had us do anything else, right? Nothing. Okay. Got to speak up? My hearing ain't what it was. Read her soul. Oh, look, we got XP. This must be it. You feel her essence humming and buzzing. Another personality instead of memories lies dormant within her soul, convulsing as if in fitful sleep. The contours of that dormant soul are sharp, ragged. As you reach out for it, it seizes you violently. You're standing in a darkened feast hall. Sturdy tables and benches have been stacked against the door in the far end of the room. You know it won't be enough. A few dozen other dwarves from your tunneling crew wait with you, shovels and pickaxes in their shaking hands. Zenove, please. If we go now, we can get behind the barricade. We, we won't do any good here. He's right. And you hear agreement and the quiet murmur of the others. But Armsward and Maroon ordered you to hold your ground here. Yet in those rising whispers, you hear the opening bars of mutiny. You've never tolerated insubordination from your crew, and you aren't about to start. So, you heft your pickaxe and swing it into the man's skull. He collapses, and the others fall silent. The acrid odor of urine rises from his body. We're going to go down fighting. Anyone who feels differently can settle it with me right now. Your voice is hoarse from hours of shouting orders, but no one else moves. They cast their eyes down in the flickering torchlight. Something thuds against the door. The others raise their weapons, picks, shovels, and a few swords. But they don't dare flinch. Your own pulse pounds at your temples. You pull back from Tana's soul, but you feel Zenova's wrath and ferocity tugging at you still. Her essence thrashes, lashing out at an unseen enemy. Zenova is powerful, but dangerous too. Her fury has anchored her to old and threatening memories. You consider that there may be others you could awaken. Tana, however, seems unaware of any of this and she blinks back at you with cloudy, placid eyes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah? So we have one person. There might be more, though. Let's continue. Hmm. We could check... There's a bunch of people at the inn. There's Thiersh. There's uh, that vendor. There's the guy who wanted to forget... We had to go digging for his, um... Hey there. Let me know if you need anything. His something or other. <laughs> I thought you were cured. You mean you always look like that? Yes, fine. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm doing much better, actually, and everything seems to be working like it ought to, so... Thanks. Take care. I'll be going. All right, now let's, let's read his soul. Hey there. Let me know if you need anything. Actually, does he... Sure. Do we have any ask questions away. we can ask him? Not sure uh, what I can tell you, though. I haven't been here half as long as most. What can you tell me about Stalwart? Truth is, I couldn't care less about the town. Or the mines. But I like the people. Hardy bunch. Living up here in the cold. Shame most of them have packed up. Feels like everything's conspiring to chase us out of here sometimes. Just means the ones of us that are left are the most stubborn-headed, right? Or foolish. Who are you? Me. Well, I used to build houses. These days I do this and that. Get work at the fishery sometimes, mending nets. Right now I'm helping with the stockades. The ogres keep us busy. I'm from Ina's Rest originally. Not so far from your Cadnua, actually. A little ways east. Nice lake nearby. A little like the one here. I heard some business went down with Lord Radric. Might have ended up tithing to you instead if I were still there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's right. all the questions. Anything else then? Uh, yeah, I'll just, uh, you know, read your soul. 
The snowy paths peel away, and the brisk air gives way to the acrid stench of smoke. A dark cloud billows up from the remnants of a burning house, at the far edge of a rocky field. You are low to the ground, held in place, and above you, the wind tugs embers back and forth like firebugs. The vision Not in so your brave now, are you? Whoa. The vision in your left eye is clouded, such that the figure standing over you is a collection of rough smears of black cast in silhouette by the fire. A dark shape swings towards your face, and the subsequent burst of agony jars you out of the memory and back into your own skin. What the hell? What? Did I spill something on myself? Huh. Leave. Well, that's suspicious as all hell. Ready when you are. What if not this guy's problem. not, like, the innocent dinglebutt that he seems to be? Um, let's check with Thiersh first before we go into the inn. Because there's so many people in the inn that we could check. Maybe these hunters, huh? Can we check these hunters? No. Yeah, there's even the basement. Those people down there, they haven't really done anything as well. Well, they did offer us to gamble, so there's a purpose. Just say the word. Uh, Thiersh would be a weird choice. Well, Because he's tied to a quest. Have a seat by the fire if the cold's gotten into your bones. Zoink! Thiersh's soul is a vibrant, stolid... Stolid? Is that like stoic and solid? A stolid thing. As you reach out for it with your senses, you see your breath begin to fog in the air. You find yourself far above the ground, wedged into the juncture of two branches. The moonlight is bright upon the snow, and in the distance, your quarry steps out onto the ice, as if onto an illuminated stage. You still your breath and draw back your arrow. Warmth bleeds back into your limbs, frost and snow giving way to the smoky interior of Thiersh's home. Welcome. Have a seat by the fire if the cold... Yeah, okay. Yeah? You're not one of them. Uh, there is... Hmm. We can check with the vendor, uh, Irden, or Ir Irudin? I forgot his name. Irden? I think so. The Y guy. Ready when you are. And then we can check over, um, at the dude here. Let's see. Surely not. You don't have... Yeah, okay. You're not even available. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, Ista. Did we have a quest for Ista? I don't even think so. Or remember. This is going to be fantastic. Oh, yeah. She was... Ready when you right. Back home. Okay. I remember you. Where'd that other guy go who we had to do that favor for? Hmm... Maybe he just walked away, never to be seen again, or went into the inn. Anybody still in here? No. Nobody came in to look around. Had to check. Okay, so, hmm. I guess we can check that area in between the fishery and uh, the temple, and then we'll go into the inn. Oh yeah, we need to also buy campfires and stuff at the inn. We'll do that first thing. That way we don't forget. Okay. Here we are. Maybe the innkeeper? I don't know. There are a lot of different people around. Surely, giving us a choice, it there must be more than one person who's available for this. Ready when you are. When it delivers it like that. Uh, bard? No. Yeah, of course not. Okay, let's first get, um... Got rid of that little fella, eh? Take this with my thanks. Didn't need his trouble around here. Oh, right, the Orlin dude, who was like a murderer, but also a slave. Anyway, what brings you back? Um... Let's see what you Nothing got first. Nothing like a pint. Okay. 
Uh, what have you? Um, what blah, 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 blah. Almost forgot what I was even looking for. Buy two. Because that's all we can hold. Nice. Okay, now let's Back read this. warm your hand, Jay. What can I do for you? You see a room, dark and damp. A cellar. It looks like part of the inn rather than an old fortress. Through Haverick's eyes, you're, you admire rows of gleaming bottles, recently dusted and polished. As you step back from the shelves, you look on with satisfaction at a pressure plate concealed in the stone floor. You all right? I won't serve you if you're already drunk, you know. He squints at you. Farewell. Hmm, is she really the only one? Vera? Again. I'll be gone just as soon as the weather you clears. Oh, we can read both of their souls. Let's start with Andrid. A handful of memories dart across your mind like startled fish, leaving indistinct images and sounds in their wake. For a moment, you are overwhelmed, until one particular recollection tugs at your senses with stubborn force. You, or Andrid, or both, kneel on a stone floor, held between two men. The man pacing in front of you wears the armor of a crucible knight, and you feel Andrid's half-hearted contempt for him as if it were your own. You feel Andrid's triumph, too, when the knight comes just close enough for you to spit blood onto his boots. The memory slips away from you, and you find yourself back in your own shoes. Okay. And... Beerthwin. Beerthwin. The whiff of salt and brine is in your nostrils before the room has even faded. The ground heaves beneath your feet, and a spray of ocean water roars over the railing as the ship heals under the wind. The ship shudders violently, and you are thrown against the railing. In that moment, you find your gaze pulled to the pitching surface of the dark sea. And see there an eye, broad as a shield, gazing back at you in turn. Fear and fascination sweep through your mind, even as your senses recede and the memory fades. Wow. Even you are. Look forward to that in the sequel, huh? And there's no way it could be Katie, right? Because she could die. They could have both oh, died. You. I'm so glad you came by. Oh, we I never even talked to her, to did we? Properly. They told me what happened. God's bless you, sir. I owe you my life. I know it was foolish of me to run in there. But this ring is all that I have of my family. What's so special about the ring anyway? Sentiment, mostly. When he first settled here, my grandfather had a ring fashioned from the first batch of ore he excavated. It was supposed to commemorate his fresh start. He passed it on to his daughter, and my mother gave it to me in turn. How are you holding up? Oh, I'm managing. Fenway's letting me stay with her until I'm back on my feet. Everyone's been lovely, really. It was hard seeing what's left of the house. But Raybald says he's going to see a hut raised for me soon as they get the logs. I like her accent. Ready when right. you are. As predicted, we can't even uh, scan her, her soul, or reach out to her soul. What have you? Oh, what about her? That would be interesting. Something I can do for you? Halfrick's got me straightening the rooms, but I'll help you if I can. Grab that soul. You feel for a. Alina's, uh, Alina's, Alina, there you go, Alina's essence and almost instantly find yourself wrapped in darkness. It takes you a moment to realize that you've plunged into a very old memory, but as your eyes adjust to the torchlight, you find yourself standing in a gloomy tunnel that you indistinctively recognize as part of Durgan's battery. Oh shit, right, because she wasn't really used for anything else either. Oh, yeah, of course. Chekhov's gun! A handful of figures in patchy cloaks and hoods, dwarves like you, hunch over a minecart. They're loading it with cloth-wrapped bundles from which you see the occasional flash of metal, the edge of a blade or the burnished glow of plate. The other dwarves scurry with a curious mixture of haste and caution. They stack the bundles in a din of muted clangs and thumps following the echoes of their ruckus down the tunnel with nervous eyes. Pay attention! Sooner we get this done, sooner we can go. Your voice is a dry whisper, and your nerves tingle with energy. 
You feel the same apprehension that the others do, but unlike them, you relish it. Still, you look over your shoulder. You look over your shoulder, just in case. We're hurrying, Captain Gregor. Honest. One of the men addresses you. When you turn back, the others have redoubled their efforts, and you feel a pleasurable twist in your gut as they fill the cart. Being captain of the guard doesn't pay much, but it does allow you to visit the armory without raising eyebrows. And with Coin Master Zoltan selling off half of the battery's arsenal, who's going to notice a few more missing pieces? Besides, you've got a buyer lined up, as long as you can move these goods out of the battery before someone squeals. You pull back from the memory to find Oina staring at you. Sir? Excuse me, sir. You all right? Her head is cocked, and her brow is furrowed. All right. So she's a prime yeah. suspect. She's our prime choice, in my opinion. I guess the drawback is that she's pretty young. So we'd curse her with having a double person for a longer time than we would cursing this older lady with a double person. But of course, the catch is that the older lady, although she's cursed with that double person for a shorter amount of time, that double person is evil as hell, seemingly. Whereas Just hers word. seems fishy, but not not as bad. Uh, read that soul. For a moment, your senses are overwhelmed. There are fumbling hands at your belt, and your own low laughter in your ears. Your shoulder is jammed up against the cabinet, and it rattles every time Beertwin leans down to kiss you. There's a sedate pleasure to the memory, but nothing in it has much to do with the battery. Okay, see ya. So that was everyone, right? Uh, let's see. Oh, we can't we can't look at a local map. Just of say the word. Stalwart, can we? We actually have to head out. Hmm. I don't believe there's any other buildings, right? There's nothing next to the fishery, huh? If there is, I've really completely forgotten about it. I want to say we covered all of our bases. But let's double check just to be safe. Hmm. No, yeah, that one burnt down too. Fair enough. Okay, I guess we found our person. Sorry, room cleaner, housekeeping lady. It's just not your day. <laughs> well, I suppose when we come back, we will ruin this poor lady's life. <laughs> Apparently, we're not asking her ahead of time. Yeah. We're not giving her a choice in it. We're just going to do it. Uh... In the meanwhile, I might actually sell off some extra stuff at Haverick. Because we've got a... From going into um, Galvino's basement, we've got a whole bunch of garbage. At, yeah, look at all these extra swords. I'm sure we can sell some other stuff as well. Man, my voice is like dying on yeah. me. So much reading this time around. <laughs> Feeling a little uh, stressed on it. Alright, until next time. Peace. Peace.